So Alex, do you have any insight into uh, how exactly you're setting up uh, the portrait? Um, let me think. Well, I'm pretty like straight on right now. So I just kind of found where I want my top of the head and bottom of the head, and then trying to find like the halfway point and then gonna build out from there. And I left enough space to hopefully add in that arm. Either, it'll either fit or just kind of crop out. So I might just start going for some shapes now that I kind of know where the halfway, where the eye line is. I've seen in the chat um, Yes, yeah, so I'm seeing in the chat that we have people from a Louisiana Blue Mountain house. I don't know who that is. Uh, uh, Franklin, Tennessee, Boston, Germany, LA, New York, Iraq, uh, Brazil. Uh, Victoria, Australia, LA, um, Birmingham, UK, Haiti. I don't know if I, I don't know if I've, I've seen uh, uh, in, anybody from Haiti on the on the stream before. So that's pretty cool. Uh, maybe we should keep yeah. track of like which countries we have people viewing from. Uh, let's see Chicago, where it is a nice seven degrees there. Uh, nice. People from all over. Yeah, wow, that's crazy. That's awesome. Uh, Columbia as well. I've got all of these people from all over watching me. And yeah, all I've done is a smudge. Just a smudge. Somebody from Manchester. Alex, I feel like in the past hey, you've uh, been a bit more gestural in your approach. You tried to be more. Uh, like conceptual or something or like is, is this a different approach than you usually go with i have, i have no idea what i'm doing i'm just i i feel like i should have figured out like an idea of how i was going to do this and i'm sort of just trying to decide right now and i feel like what i'm doing right now feels a bit too stiff so i might start trying to be a bit looser and just kind of wing it but no no plan we have somebody asking uh, who's painting today so it will be uh alex mazia and uh, lewis carr lewis is currently upstairs uh, grabbing some brushes because we have some technical difficulties as you may have noticed uh, they are painting a portrait of one of the uh, artists in residence here, uh, Caroline, who previously has been uh, one of the artists, but today she has volunteered to be the art. Yeah. So, she is the art and the artist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have. 
I have the like cushion that I stand on when I paint, but it might be big. Calves. Oh, I think he's getting it. Change. This is good. Hopefully, this doesn't change. Luckily, he's still pretty stages. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay, everybody. I'm I'm back. I don't have my glasses, but I always think about the fact that in the first stage. Um, it's good to have blurry eyes anyway, right? <laughs> the lovely Caroline. We've been gunning for her to model for a long time. She finally said yes. <laughs> Actually, she volunteered, and that was the sweetest thing ever to do. Huge sacrifice kind of to, to um, you know, Take a break from all of your art making and be the art, like Nick said. So we appreciate it. So everyone, tell us where you're from, what's going on in your neck of the woods. Have y'all seen the friend COVID lately? You have friends that have seen the friend COVID. If you haven't, then and if you can't, if you say no to both of those, then you live in like, you know, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, Siberia. Um, so I hope everybody feels like they're being, you're staying healthy and safe. Crazy world out there. Off the, the top of the screen. You can't see hmm. the Switch to a different uh, angle. Oh. Somebody's asking about downloading the reference image. So that will be uh, available during the first break, correct? Yes, I'm going to uh, take shots at the first break. Uh, because we are running behind, we thought it'd be best to go ahead and get the broadcast going and um and then we will we will go from there so how's that uh, looks, looks great. awesome i i you know the big thing i just like to do is try to give myself as much challenge as possible and just like eliminate at least the first session you know who needs the first session <laughs> Oh, man. This is going to be so much fun. I tell you what. Very few models as lovely as this one right here. If uh, maybe uh, Mr. Sean will, will join later and mm -hmm. make a fun comment. <laughs> you know, make an attempt to embarrass her. So we do have a question uh, from Luke Valencia. Uh, Luke asks, are you using a pre-mixed palette and how does that affect your process? Pre-mixed. Do you have some pre-mixed colors on there, Luke? I don't have any. Well, actually, I do have a pre-mixed color. Uh, earlier, I mixed up just some cobalt blue and some white to kind of give a kind of a king's blue as a as a you know i find that it's such a powerful color and it's a bit of a bully that i i like to go ahead and have a light version of it so that when i'm mixing it with the lighter areas of my palette that it's um, that it works so a great question i'm i'm that's the only color i have that's a pre-mixed color yeah, and I don't have any 
pre-mixed at the moment. And uh, you can't see my palette on there anyway, right? Uh, no. Okay. Well, I like put parameters down for where I wanted the top and bottom of the head and I just grew like times two somehow. That <laughs> means I need to step back and breathe. <laughs> You know, I, I can't remember what what was the last painting I went from life that we actually did a um, a portrait. I think it was. It's been a bit, if I remember correctly. Yeah, because we've been doing still life. Okay, we're gonna try to. Right now, I just want to place it, just kind of place where I want this to exist. You know, it's one of those things where in the first session. I probably only have a few minutes left in the first session, so I might as well just work on placing the piece. So, uh, Yana Golikova uh, says, went to see art show at LA. Alex's work was mesmerizing. I actually cried a bit when I saw it. Um, oh, man. That is awesome. It's a big compliment. Yeah, thank huge you compliment. so much for going to see it. I, I think like when I was first getting into art and I was like journaling, I would write edgy things like, I want to make art that makes people cry. So you have achieved my goal. <laughs> that is truly awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alyssa Alexanian says, uh, I have a question regarding tonal contrast. I've heard Lewis and Alex mention about minimizing tonal contrast. Can you explain why this is important and how to achieve it? And clarify that she's from Blue Mountains, Australia. Because I think she wrote Blue Mountains, Aust earlier, and I, I guess uh, I, I'm not familiar enough with Australia. Well, I guess Alex and Vivi probably uh, uh, are so lucky they would have gotten that. Uh, so, yes. Yeah. Any questions from Australia? We. I, me and Divya actually tried to go to the Blue Mountains, but it was when like everything was on fire, so we weren't able to. But that's like one of Divya's favorite places, so that's awesome. Um, I guess what they, I feel like what they mean that what we've talked about is simultaneous contrast. Mm. Yeah, because I'm I'm trying to think about like what. Um, tone in, in the tonal world, if I've mentioned tonal contrast. Um, and I think you're right. I think that she's probably talking about maybe simultaneous contrast. Let us know if simultaneous contrast is what you mean, because I'm, I, I'm not necessarily familiar with what you mean with tonal contrast. So, um, but yeah, maybe that'll be helpful to to know. So right now I'm just kind of enveloping what I want to do and how much of this compositionally I want to put in. Mm. Um, but simultaneous contrast, I'll go into like uh, what that is. Basically, our eyes are designed to, to see, um, you know, we're, we're, supposed to, we're able to see nuance really well. And the reason being is, is that if we see a dark next to a light, our eye actually exaggerates the dark and the light, especially if it's two darks like sandwiching a light or two lights sandwiching a dark. It'll make the dark darker if it's two lights sandwiching it, or it'll make the um, <clears throat> light lighter if two darks are sandwiching it. And so because of that ha happening, sort of the illusion in our eye, um, it is, it is a, sort of a pitfall for people to, um, to make one thing darker and lighter. So like you might make 
the reflected light in the shadow a little bit brighter than it should be, and then it competes with something that's in the light, and your eye can't compute what's really what's light enough and what's dark enough, and it flattens your image. So we try to tell people by saying, leave a certain amount of value range for your darks and a certain amount of value range for your lights and maybe more in your lights. Uh, and that will help you <clears throat> achieve uh, more easily what you're trying to achieve. So, um, so that's how that works. I mean, that's like a, a very basic form of it. Uh, you know, I could, I could wax for hours on it because I mean, it also applies to color as well as value. Um, so, but, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, hmm, maybe I should, you know, I digress. Yeah, I'm thinking the, uh, the, the still light that I'm currently working on, uh, there's, there's a white tablecloth and then everything's on top of, and there's a fold in it. And so, uh, for like, you know, when I first painted it, I made the fold, the shadow in the fold, all right, don't move. To I'm going to take pictures. Uh, Lewis just kept coming. He's like, make that lighter, make that lighter, make that lighter. Because of the simultaneous contrast, uh, I was making the shadow way too dark because it felt dark compared to the to the light. But as a result, it, it didn't feel like the, uh, the white tablecloth was you know, reflecting light or anything. All right, everybody. I'm going to take some shots of her real quick, and we'll upload them onto... Um, onto the site so everyone can follow along. Um, so just give us a second for it to, for all of us to kick in and have it ready for you. Some real paint down um, on this canvas now. I did re remember I wanted to go get some of my lean medium, so I'm going to go do that real quick. Yeah, I was using I was using a little hand mirror to look at my I was looking so I could see both my painting and Caroline in the same at the same time cuz it has a way of kind of when the image is flipped it shows you your errors like more easily because it's sort of like seeing with a fresh eye. And it sort of makes it feel more like just abstract shapes instead of the portrait you're so used to looking at. So I find it really helps me figure stuff out. All right. And we, uh, we have clarification about the, the question of the minimizing tonal contrast. Uh, she says perhaps the phrase was minimizing tonal range regarding flesh tones. Compressing tonal range was another phrase I heard. Uh, like some tonal range. Um, well, I, the, typically when I'm talking about tone, tonal things I'm talking more about like the harmonies between things. Um, but yeah, maybe so. Maybe I was 
saying that. I, I, at this moment, I, I can't recall that uh, talking about that, so I'm not sure if I can even speak on it. So I'm kind of unfamiliar with it, but it sounds to me like we're talking about in what way you know you sort of isolate different parts of the painting to have certain ranges and in both color and value so that the painting stays interesting um, so maybe that's part of like what we're referring to there yeah and it's, that's my hope. it seems like also maybe a bit about just compression in general and why you would compress the values. Mm -hmm. um, and that I feel like falls into what you were talking about with sort of simultaneous contrast and not falling into that, but also compressing your values to be somewhat more similar and unified in the lights and more similar, similar and unified in the darks so that you get a clear sort of picturesque uh, design instead of so let's say so many middle tones in your lights and so many middle tones in your darks and nothing and it all becomes this kind of mess of middle tones and you don't quite get a good design mm, yeah would be a reason why you would compress stuff I'm not sure if you're, I think it was actually, oh, it's Kristen, I believe, uh, who hey. was saying that you like my theme music. Ooh. Check that out. Kristen, you know, even from afar, you're keeping us, you're keeping us straight, <laughs> keeping it real. <laughs> Yes, my mic was muted. Thank you. Anytime, guys, that my mic is muted, sometimes when I'm like running upstairs or something or heading to the restroom, we mute our mics so that, you know, none, uh, no <laughs> unwanted noise, you know, filters to, to you know, cyberspace. So um, if I don't turn it back on, please let me know because I that, that would be quite helpful for you to hear what I have to say. Actually, maybe it's helping because <laughs> <laughs> maybe what I have to say isn't that that great anyway. No. Um, now I'm not asking. I'm not like you know trying to fish for compliments there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the poor attempt to at sort of a false sense of humility. Yeah, I'm you know, I'm trying to like make interesting marks in the underpaint lower painting uh underpainting while I'm getting it things down a bit. Um, and the whole idea being that, um, you know, while I'm starting to block this thing in that I am making something that feels beautiful at the same time, you'll see me like I'll you know, start using like fan brushes and larger brushes to kind of uh, get the same point across. And, you know, just because since this layer is so thin, might as well uh, play around with it. So, um, yeah. Um, but I'm trying to also play catch up. You know, Alex is getting ahead of me. I gotta, gotta stay in the game, man. Perhaps next time, Lewis, you can uh, play mustard. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. That was the worst <laughs> Nicholas, ladies and gentlemen, he'll be here all night or only half the night. <laughs> they don't tell them that they might leave. <laughs> um. 
The um, question from earlier that got, kind of got lost in some of the, I think it was around the break, uh, Alex uh, says, hey guys, what types of brushes are you all using to draw the portraits? Well, I'm using a myriad of brushes. I'm right now. I'm using one of the Rosemary uh, Michael Klein series. It's like one of the very first series where it was actually a rose color stem. You know, I'm gonna hang on to these. These will be the valuable ones because they're going to be the rare ones because he went to black stem uh, oh, yes, yes, later. Yes, so all of a sudden, like we'll be able to auction them off <laughs> for lots of money later. Uh, first edition Michael Klein brushes. But uh, I also have a bristle brush, a, lar a large bristle, bristle, bristle brush. And um, I'm using just a really cheap fan brush that I got at Jerry's or at Arama, um, using several rosemary flats, a few more smaller rounds. It really, it's a large assortment of brushes that I have. And I'm using a number four rosemary Eclipse Long Filbert. And then a number two rosemary eclipse long flat to kind of erase as my eraser brush. There we go. I'm already trying to start thinking about how the shadows shapes fall. Actually, a figurative artist, Benjamin, Benjamin Luster, says, I see a rabbit in your shadows, LOL. <laughs> now, whose shadows? Maybe there's a rabbit in both. Probably mine. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Maybe, maybe this is this is what uh, you, you were going for, but I, I'm reminded of a, a trick that Lewis taught when I was you know, first learning to uh, to draw, and it's like to look at kind of the abstract shapes. It helps to actually look for some kind of uh, shape there. So, for instance, I was drawing a skull. But if you go to my Instagram, uh, you'll be able to, I don't know, hey, I think it's Nicholas Thorpe. Maybe it's Nicholas D. Thorpe. I don't remember. Uh, hey, if you're going to do a plug, you might want to find out what your uh, what yeah, your handle I, I was is. Not prepared. Uh, <laughs> But like I noticed there was something in like the, the zygomatic arch or something, and I, I, I thought it looked exactly like a dinosaur, uh, which got me excited about drawing it and also was super helpful for being able to make sure I'm getting the correct shape. So, um, you know, if you see a rabbit in those shadows, yep. the rabbit that you see. Absolutely. Um, one of the best things you can do is take the right side of your brain and feel, flip it on its end to um, – the left side to actually be able to see things like that. So very good point. Uh, Benjamin or Benjamin, I apologize if I am, uh, if, if I uh, am messing up your name, uh, but uh, says, uh, so I took the plunge and left my day job to do art full time three weeks ago. Any advice? Um. You know, that's a loaded thought right there and uh, a question because there's so many things. Um, ho hopefully you've, you've, you've already kind of uh, been doing it as a side hustle for a little while to get yourself going. Um, I would highly recommend thinking about that um, of, you know, when, you, when you're getting ready to quit, do it in a calculated and planned way. Um, that's exciting, really. You know, there's, this career is, is such a wonderful one. Um, you know, I, I'm thankful that I get to paint every day um, or <laughs> I'm thankful that I at least uh, try to make the attempt to paint every day is probably a better um, way of putting it. But um, it's, it's amazing. I would say that the first thing to do is get organized. Second thing to do is make sure that you've created yourself a good schedule Third thing to do is find some partners that you can that can hold you accountable, at least in like your studio, and that'll help keep you motivated because it, it can be a very lonely career if you don't. Alex, what kind of advice do you have for him? 
Um, let me think about this. Well, yeah, having a good schedule. I mean, definitely just 100% treating it like a job. And since you quit your day job, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> definitely treat it as a job. job. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, yeah, I don't know what to say with that, but just, that's great. And go for it and make sure you've got, uh, make sure you've got some uh, commissions lined up or a gallery that can show your work. Um, you know, that, that will really help you. Uh, maybe you've got a nest egg set aside, you know, for just such an occasion and you're planning on using the nest egg while you get your career launched. Um, feel like that, there's a lot that'll hold you accountable to doing that. That's, that would be awesome. Yeah. So, that's the thing. How much money you have saved, how long you can mess up. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, that was me. And I moved to North Carolina to be with the East Oaks gang. I had a certain amount of money from when I won a competition. And once that ran out, I was going to have to get a job. But things started to, things started going well before that. So, but I would have worked a part-time job and just kept my expenses really low so that I could continue to give good hours to pay me. Yep. Yep. Uh, he really, he did a leap and started to fly. I, you know, part of it is, is just having the, the moxie to leap is, is, um, largely what it, you know, what it takes. So, uh, commend him for really going for it. And I commend you for really going for it, you know, um, it's, it, it, it'll get hard at times to make sure you've just got good support system around you of other artists, um, people that can hold you accountable, um, you know, and go from there. So, all right. Um, did you use the syntax to check on the reference image? It seems like people aren't oh, seeing it. Oh, okay. Thank you, George, and the content. Yeah, so the, the vertical palette is uh, ed, is from Edge Pro Gear. Tina Figarelli asks, uh, anyone have any new projects they're working on to discuss? Um, I, wow, I... I... <laughs> Yes, I, I've got quite a few projects going, um, largely due to, oh, there's about three more minutes left, just so you know, um, largely due to uh, commission work. Um, and I'm just trying to like get through a large amount of them, uh, which is a huge blessing. I'm you know, very thankful. So um, you know, this isn't most certainly a complaint. It, it's exciting, but um, it, the amount that I have to get through is quite large. And so it's, it's a little overwhelming to think about because it's, it's just a mountain and you're looking at the mountain and wondering, you know, how you're going to get through it all. So, um, but we're going to get there and I think it's going to be just, just fine. But Alex just got off of his big show and you know he's been doing what exactly what i think he needs to do which is take some time to to use a season for learning and to try to grow something new and new ideas and tell him about it alex <laughs> take it away <laughs> i've been doing a lot of stuff but none of them are finishing painting so it feels like 
I'm not doing, you know, a lot, but I have like six paintings going on at the same time right now. Three that are from life and three that are from like reference, um, reference images and just trying different approaches. And when I first got back from my show, I put myself through a series of just drawing block ins. Then I've been learning some constructive anatomy. Just, yeah, a whole bunch of random stuff that I've been wanting to do, but keep putting off because I've been working on shows. Mm. But there's always that guilt of like, can you still do a painting, Alex? Yeah. You know how to finish a painting. Um, that, that feeling, everybody, no matter how professional you are and how long you've been doing it, kind of never goes away. Of almost like, am I going to forget to paint how to paint uh, if I take a break? And then sometimes you get back to these when you're like, do I even know how to do this again? Vicky okay. Sullivan asks, do you, all, uh, do you all have tips and or tricks to keep the eyes soft but accurate, as in brushes or techniques or processes? Hmm. Well, I can tell you a story. It happened today when I was painting the eye on a painting. Um, I spent about three hours trying to paint this eye, but the drawing kept moving around. And then it came time for lunch, and I just completely wiped out all like a couple hours of work on one eye because I wanted that exact same thing. I wanted the drawing to be correct, but I wanted it to be soft and nice. And it wasn't soft and nice, and I messed up the drawing. So, if you have any tips for me, Vicky Sullivan, <laughs> I could use them. If that's who said that, I think that's. Uh, did you say soft and nice, or soft and soft eyes? Uh, what did What did you say? Uh, keep the eyes soft but accurate. Eyes soft and accurate. Gotcha. Um. It's funny because in our open critique night, that was one of the uh, questions in his work. So, um, and I believe it was somebody different. So that's interesting that that's the same question. Alex is so good at it, though. You know, I, I, I was looking at the one he did of um, the African American girl when I was looking at the eyes, and they're so soft, but they have such a like an accuracy and feel good feel to them. Um, I'm going to let. Uh, Alex, keep talking about that. I, actually, we're going to take, because of uh, the models taking a break, I'm, I have found that the reference images haven't been put up yet, so I'm going to look into that real quick and see if I can get the reference images. I sent them to um, somebody else to see if we can get them put up, so I'm going to work on trying to get those up for everybody. So. And we're back, everybody. Um, all right, ready to go for another round. By the way, because we just got started late, uh, Caroline promised that she'll do a three more hours additional on the other on the other end for three thousand dollars. Thousand an hour. So that's pretty good. Thousand an hour. You know, you'll you'll start having doctors become models. <laughs> so. We are currently in the process of uploading the uh, website. I apologize for the unexpected delay, but in the meantime, we are putting up the reference images uh, next to uh, each person's uh, painting, so that way you can have you know, some view of it uh, while we wait on getting that up. Uh, thank you for your patience. All right. Nick has such a fantastic radio voice. We'll keep them around. <laughs> Alyssa uh, says, uh, may I ask regarding cool underpainting versus warm underpainting, is this purely determined from the model's flush tone, or is it sometimes a design choice? 
Hmm. Um, well, for me, uh, because I paint thinly, things tend to air on the side of warm a lot more than they do cool. Um, but, but I would say that um, I also prefer if I'm going to have parts of the underpainting show through, I prefer it to have a warm, warmer feel. So, so yeah, I would probably say warm underpaintings where, where I like to go with that. How about you, Alex? Yeah, I don't think I've ever done a cold underpainting. Um, I know that, like, I've tried to do a grisaille with just raw umber, and when you mix raw umber with the white, it gets pretty cold. Uh, I did not like painting on top of that. So it would have to be a design choice if I ever decide decided to do it. Mm. But I don't know when I would. We're going to just go ahead and make a, a top color here. So putting some color down. It's like Alex said, you know, like he was painting the eye like for three hours. I, I could just stay on like one thing for three hours. And um, all of a sudden, next thing you know, you haven't done anything. So got to keep moving. It's part of the name of the game when it comes to these things. Keep on moving. So, so speaking of the eye, uh, Vicki Sullivan, who was asked, she was the one asking about the eye. She says, thanks, Alex. Oh, yeah. That makes me feel better. I'm trying out small round bristle brushes to build them up. Mm. Nice. Yeah, I thought of a possible an answer to help with that question. I know because Louis brought up a, a specific painting of mine. If I use like a flat that has have has sort of a wispy end to the brush, if everything that's let's say if a line is going on the eye is going horizontal, if I use a flat brush and kind of go vertical with my brush strokes, I can tend to try it, it to soften it with the featheriness of the brush because I'm going vertical, but also kind of draw with it at the same time. So I don't know. I like it. Yeah. Sounds good to me. A question for Mr. Lewis Carr. <laughs> um, I was just curious. So I've just written a book called Ink, which is uh, really gold and green um yeah it's about just people that are really like experts in their field and um and just like their habits and stuff and um i was just reading it then i was curious really what was the point because you painted um quite a bit before going to gca or like you know a decent mm -hmm. amount when was the bit where you thought i needed to you needed to up your game. Like, what was what was that moment when you realized that? Oh, that's funny. I actually know exactly what that moment was. Um, when I was when I was uh, painting professionally at home, I really didn't realize how large of a close knit community the art world was. Um, I was just this little boy in Mississippi painting, and that was about it. And um, and so. I, uh, I got wind of Portrait Society, and I had, I had briefly heard of it when I was in high school, because that's when it started, was when I was like a freshman or sophomore in high school. And I had known, I heard briefly about it because the guy that was sort of my role model um, either hadn't gotten an award there or as part of the founding members or something uh, to, that, to that effect. And... Um, and so I was like, you know, I should check that out. So I ended up going one year and I remember seeing the finalists work and just being blown away by a couple of the people. And I was just like, okay, I, that feels so real that I feel like it's actually coming off the page. And, um, and so I was like, I know that I think I'm capable of painting like that. 
I just don't know how they're painting like that. I need to find out how. And I was like, well, I can probably read everything under the sun and probably figure it out eventually on my own. It maybe take me 10 years. Or I can go to some program, and I was listening to them, and a lot of people were talking about ateliers at the time. And I was like, I, I just need to go to like a school and learn this because I felt like I had plateaued in my learning. And um, I was like, I don't think I'm learning any faster than I used to. I, I felt like there was a big learning curve at one point and then it just stopped. And so that's, that was really the turning point is seeing the finalist work. And then I met uh, several people. I met Nick Alm, that was his first year to go to the Portrait Society, he was a finalist. And he didn't know anybody, and I kind of like walked up to him, I had no clue who he was, and at that time, he wasn't known at all. No one knew who he was. And, um, you know, he wasn't showing at Arcadia. He, he literally had just gotten done, like with doing a resident program at Odd Nerdrums, just like you. And, um, and so, but I met him and Teresa Oaxaca and Greg Mortensen that, that time. And they all were like, yeah, we went to Florence Academy. We went to, you know, uh, Grand Central. And I was like, okay, that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start looking at those places. And um, that's kind of what started the whole thing. And when, when you were at um, GPN, did you feel that um, there was a need for uh, kind of the Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, I feel like there's a big up curve. I don't know if I've ever felt like a plateaued actually. Um, but I do believe I left sort of at my peak of learning from there. Um, I don't feel like I could have learned um, far too much more than I already had by that point. So, um, so yeah. That's what I had so, to say so about that. Kind of just, just to keep, I, I think this is an interesting topic. So uh, I, I guess people starting off at GCA have varying levels where, you know, maybe some are a lot younger. Up, you know, you were a person who was working as a full-time professional painter. So what was that like kind of going back to basics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, doing bar mm -hmm. drawings? And, you yeah. know, did, was it like, oh, this is, you know, kid stuff? <laughs> or like, yeah, what was that like? That's um, that is a great question, actually. I, it was, it, to some level, it was hard because um, I was having to juggle both my career and the basic trainings that I was doing. So I was having to paint my commissions at my house while I was working on painting um, at the studio or drawing at the studio and was only allowed to draw, you know, that first year. And, um, and so, or actually really the first two years, uh, in, in actuality, but, um, all that to be said is it was, it was very difficult, um, at the very beginning. The other thing that was really hard is, you know, at that point I already had another business and I was like a boss of like 60 different people and was used to giving orders and things getting done. And I was used to, um, you know, basically being the boss. And so to like all of a sudden have to submit yourself as a student in a way was was um, kind of a surreal feeling when I was not used to being in that role um, anymore. So uh, so that took I wouldn't say it took time, but it most certainly took effort to just, you know, know that you've got to set aside. In a, in a way, it felt like you're setting aside pride, but um, really it was just like to be able to, to say, if I want to learn, I have to keep a completely open mind that these people know a lot more than I do and uh, to be okay with it. So good questions, though. Mm -hmm. um, Alex, what about for you? Just like, well, how did you improve? How did you become so aware of like the steps that you needed to take? Um, hmm. Well, I'm 
trying to think how I was aware of it. I mean, it's sort of like when Louis saying he reached a certain level by himself and then and started to like plateau, but then seeing those other like finalist works, you know, made him realize the, the higher level he could achieve. I think as I was learning, I had a very like, I just knew of very good painters. Like I knew of really like work that was really good. And so I just kept wanting to get that good and how to know exactly. I guess I would compare myself and just try and be brutally honest with myself. Mm. It's a hard thing to do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, get a get your painting and another painting and be like, ask a random person who's in your house. How close is mine to this one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or do a, a Divya um, style and be like, on a percentage scale, yes, what would you think this 10. is? Is this kind of a 90 or a? Well, I stopped asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> Learned your lesson. No, it's not a lesson to learn there. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's Here's something also too about, because it seems like both of you know what, what sort of led you to it was uh, looking at other people's paintings, right? I think mm -hmm. that there's something about seeing the paintings in person as well. Like when yeah. you're on Instagram, you see like these teeny tiny little, you know, like half inch tall painting and you don't really get a sense of, I guess, how to apply that or, or how, to, how to think about that, you know, in a way that helps your painting, which you're seeing life size. And so yeah. I'm sure like going to something like Portrait Society uh, or you know, maybe going to the nerd room school or something, but being around uh, paintings like in person, because that's how a painting is going mm. to be viewed, uh, I'm sure you know, makes you realize a, a whole level of quality that you don't get just when you are, you know, in your own house and your only access to other people's paintings are just, you know, the internet. Yeah. Yeah. I would say to that also, that reminded me that, yeah, there is kind of this thing where like, I do not, I know mine's not as good, but I do not know how. And that's, I guess, when I started thinking, okay, does this person offer a workshop yeah how can i see not only see their paintings in person but see them paint in person and that's huge i think that you know there's a great reason to be going to workshops that being the the main aspect of them is that that you're going to see a process uh that allows for them to get where they want to be in their work um so which is very, very important to, to understanding um, how you want to paint in the future too, so. And over, I forgot who we were talking to. I think it was Michael Klein, because he was talking about him and his wife we're having sort of a disagreement like, is it good to paint on, talking about Michael teaching at workshops, like is it good to be painting on the students' work because they will, they will think it's, you know, they did it or something like that. And I, as the student who got their work painted on, that was just extremely helpful. Yeah. To, to someone come onto what you've painted, all of your like wrong, you know, methods, and then see someone do something on top of it. Yeah, that's a game changer, Eric Kendi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when I was when I was drawing skulls, which again you can see online Instagram. <laughs> uh, uh, I did two different. 
actually, he did three different school drums on it, though. I think I was posted too. But I remember on the first one, uh, Lou was like, oh, you know, let me let me demonstrate this. And he did just this like teeny tiny, like one square millimeter of, uh, of drawing on it. And after I finished, I looked at it, I'm like, man, the best part of this is the one part I didn't draw. And that, you know, that, that was something that was a, a tad irritating. But I think it helped <laughs> because then the next one, the next one uh, you know, Lewis was, I think he was helping, you know, show me how to turn form. And so he did like a, a ribbon of form or something at one point, mm -hmm. uh, maybe corrected one of mine. And then I was like, I'm not going to let this happen again. So I'm going to try to make it so that you can't tell what was the part that Lewis did and what the part I did was. And so, mm. kind of, you know, having it as the goal to, I guess not cover it up, but, you know, making it so that you can't tell which was Lewis's, you know, a teeny tiny little section and which was mine. Actually, that's uh, a great. Yeah, which, you know, maybe y'all should just go to it and see if you can tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shameless. Yeah, like and comment. Like, comment. You know, repost if you want. <laughs> yeah, repost yeah, where you think. And guess where. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Make it a game. Share with your friends. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> when and then it would go to your next skull, and then you, and then you would come to my skull, and then Kristen's skull, and then it would be like an hour, and then you get a phone call, and then it, yeah, it was the whole thing. Uh, life is chaos here at East Oak Studio, and it was funny because I had all three of them doing skulls all at the same time. So it was, it was actually I think really good because it made everyone kind of see what every the eureka moments that other people were having, and. Um, made for it to be a very interesting um, or a, a, a much faster learning experience for all of them, I think. So, yeah, that was cool when everyone was working on skulls. Once I saw Kristen's skull, I was like, okay, I'm going to do a skull. Kristen, Kristen yeah, who has written something. For those of you that don't know, Kristen is one of uh, our former um, East Oak Studio residents and is um, working. Uh, we have several people working on. Caroline also is working on some artwork. I don't know if I'm able to talk about it, but I know that Kristen is working on um, getting a body of work together to be shown. Well, we do have some questions from the audience. Uh, so first, Paul Judd asks, what drawing techniques do you rely on slash practice for portraits? Um, I, you know, I have a, a pretty large quiver um, of, of investigative tools um way to go caroline uh, i'll answer this question and then we'll take a, a break real quick um we have there i have a we have a very i have a very large uh, amount of investigative tools that i use ones are uh like proportionally i try to use you know uh a comparative measurement but i don't use a lot of comparative measurement when i'm doing a la prima paintings um because it just takes too long. Uh, it's more sometimes more accurate, but it takes too long. Um, I use tilts a lot, and uh, I use shadow shapes and the associations of shadow shapes between each other. Um, and then with those, I'll also um, try to use um, some a large. I mean, a large of them is different types of shape structures that are going on with both the composition and uh, anatomical uh, features and just making sure that the anatomy features feel like they're working together. So uh, until they're all working together, I can't move on. Um, so, but big ones are shadow shapes, tilts, anatomy. All right, everybody, we'll be back in just a bit.
actually love taking the breaks because it helps me like re-see the drawing with fresh eyes. Are you talking to me? Just get the computer. I'm hearing a little bit of something, but I'm not. Have you not seen this? They're connected. Yeah, no. this isn't showing anything. You're they not. You, this are. isn't. isn't no. Actually, it's, it's actually the, nothing is showing. What's going on? I had the blue ones. Hmm. Maybe something in the blue thing. No. Have y'all touched anything? No. <laughs> Could it be when you put the batteries in the receiver? Okay, that's on the chain that you think of. Oh, she says they can hear. I guess we can't hear for some reason. I'm just going to say. Okay, everyone. Well, um, basically, if you uh, if you stop being able to hear no, any sound, let us know because for some reason on our end it doesn't show sound reception. Um, actually, everything's. Everyone, hold on just for a few more moments. We'll get started right back shortly. All right, bye, everybody, we're back. Sorry about that. And we're ready to rock and roll. Now, like I was saying, love starting back over again with fresh eyes because it helps me uh, see things. Yeah, when you take them out of your ear, yeah. they're going to shut off. Okay. Oh, sorry, everyone. I forget. <laughs> it, it has been, you know, some nights are worse than others. Tonight just happened to be one of those nights. You know what? I'm undaunted. It's not going to ruin my night. Won't let it. Uh, could you turn it a little that way? A little bit less? Yeah. I think that. I think I try. So on an exciting note, uh, although, yeah, Alex Tabbitt is saying, I'm meeting with a gallery tomorrow. Hey, Alex. On the slightly less exciting note, and the varnish for an imported piece sank in, leaving a cruddy, uneven finish. I believe I can fix it, but not in time. Should I be overly concerned about this? Hmm. I, I'll, uh, I mean... If it's one of those things you can't fix, then no, <laughs> I wouldn't be overly concerned about it. If it's something you can fix, then I would say be concerned about it and get it fixed. Um, but there's no reason to worry about something that you don't have any control over. It's uh, hard enough to worry about the things you do have control over. So, um, so that would be my advice on that. But I'm, I'm excited for you. I hope it goes well. 
you know, we're sending good vibes your way. Yeah. Any advice generally on, because there was actually a question about uh, varnishing painting. So any, any tips for uh, sealing a painting or varnishing a painting uh, to have like an even, uh, yeah, an even varnish? So he said it, it didn't dry evenly. Uh, he said uh, he said, uh, sank in and it left a pretty uneven finish. That's interesting. Those are his words. One, make sure the painting is absolutely dry. And yeah. I wonder what kind of varnish you're using. Um, I most certainly would not um, put a varnish on it while some of the painting is still wet. You could ruin your painting and um, that wouldn't be good. Um, so I would steer clear of that thought for sure. Uh, but as far as You know, I don't know how long the painting has, has been drying. <laughs> Every now and again, we get some feedback in the background. <laughs> Kristen is rocking and socking up here, man. I tell you, I hope I, okay, I paint, right. paint the beauty I see. That's all I gotta say. Kristen says, Christian, I miss you guys. On a non-art related note, what's something that's made y'all happy or smile lately? Missing everyone's laughter right now. Oh. Yeah, Kristen sent a great little photo to our group text today um, showing all of us having a game night together and we were all like super smiling and laughing um, and she just happened to capture a, a beautiful little moment and made us miss everybody. So we love you, Kristen. So glad you're, you're here. Um, what is making us happy today? Is that what, what she said? Lately, something uh, that's made yeah, us happy. made y'all happy or smile lately. Mm, that did. That text made me happy and smile lately. So, agreed. Oh yeah, I got a new camera, so I actually busted it out during the snow, the snowy time, and that was a lot of fun. I um, always love a new toy to play with, and so just playing with the tech is a blast. But um, Alex, what do you think? What's something that's made you happy lately? Seeing my smiling face every day? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, oh, the list is just so small. I never smile. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah, the snow. Rosie. The snow. <laughs> Rosie the dog. Rosie. Rosie makes all of us smile. We need to have Rosie on one night. Let her make an appearance. Yeah. Rosie is is the the mascot here at East Oak Studio. She's Parisa and my dog. And she's like one of the sweetest dogs on the planet. I know every owner says that about their dog, but I really mean it. <laughs> Rosie's different. Rosie's different. So um but yeah, she makes me smile every day. She makes all of us smile every day. She comes over and wags her tail 
So we'll go over and curl up on Caroline's rug. Mm -hmm. She loves Caroline's rug while she's painting. Go over and keep her company and when Caroline steps back from her painting, it'll Caroline help her trip. Step on her. <laughs> Well, it'd be a lot better than a dead artist. That would, that would be a tough, that'd be a tough <laughs> workshop. It's like a far side comic. <laughs> there's, the, uh, there's like the skeleton at the piano and the lady goes, Shh, the maestro is decomposing. And, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm a huge fan. But anyway. Oh, great. Um, Alex, you, you answer that one. I'm going to let you be distracted for a second okay. while I try to like get this painting back on track. All right. My workshop hit list. Um, I want to take a workshop from this guy in Russia, Ivan Loganov. He's alive. I would want to take a workshop from Stephen Assale. Um, I, I thought you've taken one from Stephen. Have you not? No. I've never, never seen the guy. Uh, did I tell you all I met him down in Scottsdale, the last workshop I was teaching? He was there. I don't know if I told you all or not. No. Um, that, was, that was a lot of fun. I took my whole class out and said, you know, we, it was the day I was teaching a lecture on color. I was like, honestly, if you want to like get a full lecture on color, you just need to go look at Stephen's paintings real quick. Everything you need to know is there. <laughs> that or, was a lot of, a lot of fun. Or they would get really confused. They get really confused. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> Good point. Um, well, my way of like who I take workshops with is just, it's sort of, I see a certain quality in a person's work that I want. And with, with Loganov, he just, the way he attacks a painting and it's so, uh, He can just attack these huge paintings and just the way he goes about it, it's almost the process seems so fun compared to how I make a painting. So I'd like to learn that from him. And then there's just certain qualities of Stephen and Sale where the painting just feels so alive. And, it, and also this painterly quality about it that I love. And his process as well. I've seen like process shots of how he goes about a painting. And I'd love to incorporate a little bit of that into my work. And Louis, what about me? <laughs> if I were to paint or uh, do a workshop with somebody today, um, Honestly, Stephen Sale is one of the ones that I would uh, love to take, actually. But um, um, you know, I I actually I've always had an intrigue of of LaFell's work. I thought I think that it would be interesting to see his process. I don't know if y'all have ever seen any of his pieces in person, but they they actually have a really powerful presence and very strong in form. And um, I was looking at one of his his award winning piece in um, at the uh, Prix de West, and it was just blown away by it. It was so beautiful. So um, I think it would be cool to take one from him. I'd like to meet Odd. Antonio Lopez would be cool. I'm talking about people who don't actually do workshops. <laughs> yeah, a question from 
Penny. Hi, Lois. Hi, Penny. Could you make sure that gets taped up so it doesn't just hang? Um, could you say that last part of the question? I didn't yeah. hear that last part. Um, how do you work with clients who want to finish work by a certain timeline, like to commemorate a life event, okay. etc. Kind of like maybe a wedding or or maybe like a birthday that they want it by. Um, yeah, those those kinds of things. Yeah, that has that happens a lot too. You'll you'll have that experience a lot. Um, I if I don't feel like I can do it, you know, right now, for example, I'm I'm booked out for about two years. In some instances, I'm about two and a half years out, um, and so I'm not even taking some particular types of orders. And um, so the first thing I would say to that is, is that I uh, don't, um, I think that you should schedule out, it depends on just how many orders you have. And if you're trying to meet the deadline, just make sure that you're capable of doing it. I tell people to give yourself double the amount of time that you think you can finish it in by. Um, that gives you a little bit of wiggle room for crazy bad situations to happen. So, and they always come up, just weird issues that'll come up um, that you have to deal with. So that being said is, yeah, I, that's, that's the advice that typically we give someone. Gary LaPaul says, I'll be in your Thursday workshop before the portrait conference. What can I expect? How should I prep? Oh, well, I'm so excited uh, to have you. Well, the, the first thing is, is we, in fact, uh, we just selected the model for that day. Um, expect that a lot of what we're going to be talking about are more mental exercises and exercises that when you're when you're drawing, you know, because it's going to be about trying to capture emotion in um, in your portrait. And so we're going to in the lecture part of the series, we're going to be talking about what ways people portray emotion on their face and then how can we use gesture as a way to to express certain ideas and feelings. And uh, we'll also even be using the idea of color uh, to represent, you know, like cinematographers often will use color to represent um, a, a particular type of an emotion. So those are like some of the things to keep in mind. Right now, I'm still actually building the curriculum um, and working out all the kinks of what every day and every breakout is going to be like. But uh, those are some of the things to, to uh, expect. But also know in all of my uh, workshops, if, if your questions, you, you can also bring questions about um, every, anything and everything I'm willing to, to help you with in my workshops. Uh, the biggest thing to, to take away, though, is that if it's not applicable at the moment, ask me after afterwards, and we can most certainly have a conversation to help you uh, wrap your mind around some question you have. Uh, likeness will also be, obviously, a part of the workshop, trying to capture likeness. Um, and yeah, those are some of the things to expect. How would you suggest students get the best from the East Coast Studio content? Any advice on pitfalls students make from learning from video lessons and how to avoid them? Mm. Honestly, sometimes I think the best thing to do with uh, East Oak Studio content is whenever somebody's demoing or demonstrating a painting, is to actually 
mimic what they are doing. You're, I think you're losing an opportunity if you don't mimic what they're trying to achieve. It's almost like trying to do a master copy, but you get to see how the master made the copy or master made the painting that you're copying. So, um, so I definitely think that that's one thing that can help you a lot. Um, Alex, do you have any thoughts there? Hmm. I really, it's, this might be somewhat the opposite of, no, I don't know. Yeah, I would say you, can, you can say the opposite. Uh, <laughs> Lewis is totally <laughs> wrong. This is how you should do it. No, I just, I remember I've never painted along with something I was watching. Not that anyone should stop right now if they're doing it. Um, but I feel like sometimes that's an excuse for them to kind of paint how they always paint when, because you're going to have to look at your painting constantly. So you're missing like all of what's going on. So mm. I don't know. I would say just be super present with what you're watching. Didn't you try to mimic the strokes and the mixtures when you're watching paint like um, videos? When, no, I, yeah. I would take notes. So I like, yeah, I would be watching and then I would be taking notes while I was watching. So I would literally write down color mixtures mm. and I would pause the video when I would do stuff like that um, and, and rewind. And so I'm sure you can, I'm sure that's actually, there's a great way to do that. I would say maybe watch it fo somewhat fully first and then try and paint it with it on. But yeah, yeah I took notes and then tried to apply what I learned afterwards. You heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. So take that, take that, um, and take that advice home, man. I think that that's a, not. I think you know, for different people, is you got to find out the best way you learn and figure out what's going to help you. Um, All right, everyone, we'll take a quick break. And if I have any more thoughts about that, I'll come back and we'll revisit that same question. Today is just one of those days where there is just littered with technical difficulties. <laughs> so. so we have a, a question. Any tips on how to get more atmosphere on your backgrounds? More atmosphere on your backgrounds. Yes, I always. Um, I, painting backgrounds thinly can help with creating atmosphere. Uh, that's one thing. Um, there is another thing is, is whenever you've got like a bright, like say like her nose and her forehead, for example, by making it slightly lighter next to it can actually give the sense of sort of a mystical extra bit of atmosphere. So that helps too. Um, also keeping your, t your, Color harmony similar, I think, help with that idea too. So back to what we were talking about before, about um, learning from videos and what's the best way. Uh, Mia commented, I agree with Alex speaking from my own learning technique. I watch intently or read the book from cover to cover, then start my own attempt, then review source material and go back and again. Well, there you go. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. That always helps. You know, sometimes our community does a better job 
of, of, uh, of making sure the best way to go about it. And my thing is, is the best way is the way you know how to learn um, and finding out what that is. So um, Penny says, hi, Alex, you mentioned you were studying constructive mm -hmm. anatomy for others who are also interested in that study. Can you suggest sources, methods, books, etc., to help with that study? Thanks. Yeah, and, and look at this. I'm about to completely contradict what I just said because all of the constructive anatomy stuff that I've been watching, I feel like I don't retain any of it unless I'm like drawing while I'm watching it. So there you go. It, de <laughs> it depends. Aha. What, what Spoken like a true attorney, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. you yeah. know, it always depends. Yeah. Um, but as for sources, I have been, there's three artists that I've been watching their videos. Um, Glenn Vilpu is one. Um, oh, what's the dude's name? Steve Steve Houston. And then the last guy, I'm trying to remember, but I was liking his videos. I'll have to think of think of the last guy, but um, I've actually been watching videos on New Masters Academy because they. They have like specific, like they'll go real deep on stuff like anatomy and stuff like that. So I've been, yeah, going on there and been really liking specifically also, yeah, Steve Houston stuff. He's the artist who he painted like a lot of boxers. Mm -hmm. Like there's two like boxes fighting each other and they're uh, one will be like flying and yeah, it's just interesting also because his it's kind, his kind of like is, the bellows painter of today, I feel like. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. I think his name is George Bellows. No. The painter. Is that famous painting of like the two boxers there that are like intertwined? That it's um, very brushy. Yeah. yeah, I think I know that painting. That yeah, specific. he did a lot of boxers like that. So I always call um, who you're talking about sort of the George Bellows of today. Yeah. Who, who else was I? Well, uh, what's it? Andrew Loomis, figure drawing for all it's worth, that book has some good stuff. Because what I was interested in was kind of breaking the, the figure down into like these big, almost structural, boxy masses so that I could, so it could help me um, compose figures from my head. So I was kind of just looking for real, simplified versions of mm. the anatomy. And yeah, there's a whole thing in the Andrew Loomis book where you like learn to draw the mannequin and then you, the cool thing is what you really learn a lot of is how to move things in 3D space. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, the head's a box and you can learn how to move it and the pelvis is a box and the torso is a box and you can yeah, learn how to shift it in three-dimensional space it's, it's a lot super cool. a lot of uh what you try to learn at gca you know it's the same idea as because the figure is moving on you so much that you need to kind of know how to shift everything in space to in your imagination almost to put it right back into position that you need it to be in yeah, I could see it being incredibly helpful with life drawing, knowing that's having that knowledge. Um, speaking of that, do you think it's better 
the learning? Do you think it would be, let's say you wanted to get better at that, but then you might want to get better at um, drawing the figure and landscape painting, you know, all, just different things that are all related, obviously, with drawing and painting. Do you think it's better to hone in on one thing um, for a few weeks or do, you know, three things you want to get better at and just keep rotating them throughout the, throughout the weeks? I'm a firm believer in honing in on the one thing, personally. I think you get a lot closer if you intentionally practice and focus your practice. Um, so, that'd be my thought on that. Yeah, I would, I, it, it's interesting. I feel like at the very beginning, when you're first just like learning how to paint and put paint down, and just getting, you know, the bearings of it. I would say try and be somewhat of like an a la prima approach where you learn how to get the right color in the right spot and you just learn how to paint. And then once you have a bit of a grasp on that, then you can sort of go into each thing individually. Because it's like... Even I think heard uh, Stan Prokopenko talking about you know artists that try and learn anatomy before they know how to draw type thing. Mm. Well, I I agree to that in the sense that um, there's something you should learn. There's foundational things you should learn before you learn other things, and so yeah, you you don't need to go diving into anatomy if you don't know how to draw, you know? So I, I, I definitely agree to that. Um, so, but I also think that isolating things in order to learn concepts and focus on them, I think is very powerful. So, um, so yeah, yet again, it depends. All depends. So a, a really good question from Wendy. Um, Alex, has your perspective changed since your show was over and have you had any epiphany moments now that you've had time to breathe? Um, well, I definitely had some, you know, moments while creating the show, just thinking, is this exactly how I want to go about my painting career? You know, working on solo, like how often do I want to do a solo show if I really want to, so that was one thing. How often do I want to do this? Because it's a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice, mm -hmm. unless you paint very fast which I don't. Um, so how often I want to do it. And then if I do want to do it less often, what else do I want to do to, you know, make money and just best enjoy my career. And then separately also thinking about, well, I'm not anywhere near the artist I want to be yet, but what would I actually have to do? to become that artist mm. and if it's just i can't just keep making painting after painting i have to eventually stop and learn somehow and figure out what i just even figure out what i need to learn what it what is it i'm lacking so yeah a lot which is overwhelming because you don't know where to start and then when you don't know where to start, time, mm -hmm. keep, time keeps passing and you're like, well, I got to start making money. So, you, but just, but Alex, don't get back into the same loop. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but I'm having all the thoughts about that. 
I mean, I think that's, it's a very honest answer. Um, because I think in your art, in your career, it changes too, as you get older, you're different, you have different values for different reasons. Um, and you start, you start going through what those, what, what do you really care about? What's really important to you, you know, and trying to figure out what that is, it, um, can be just invaluable. Um, and then it's going to change. And so doing an evaluation of where you are in life, I think is incredibly helpful at different stages, maybe like every five years or so to really go, all right, well, I've gotten this far on this thing. And in hindsight, now that I've gotten this far, is this, is this something that I want to continue to pursue? Because this was like maybe the full on dream to be like, you know, a solo show painter and, you know, uh, all the things that I thought go with it. But then now that I see what the costs are, is, is it that, is that that important to me, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes it takes the experience of going through it to, to know whether it is or not. Um, yep. so, cause <laughs> solo artists, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've watched Alex and Michael both do solo shows and, it's um, it takes a, a monstrous amount of discipline on on top of the fact that, um, you know, it's it's a powerful thing because you see all this work all at once. But um, you have to you have to, like, be very balanced with your lifestyle and frugal with your your resources, because you're you're basically putting all of this time into this one thing that you hope is going to work out, you know. It's like being a farmer. My dad was a farmer and, you know, I'd watch him, you know, he would always talk about, he's so reliant on the weather and sometimes what lobbyists are going to do in the government that you're just, you're, you're, you're you get quite stressed, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so. So this is a really good question from Jimmy. Hi, Lewis and Alex. What are your favorite movies? No. Well, I just recently saw one. I'll say I am a big, I don't want to say scary movie because everyone just thinks of the ring and the grudge, <laughs> but like a thriller, darker, somewhat scary movie buff. Um, and I just watched a movie called The Night House, and it was awesome. The and Night House. Yeah, some good movies I've seen somewhat recently are like uh, Midsummer. Um, a really scary one was Hereditary. That's probably like one of my favorite scary movies mm -hmm. do you get scared no <laughs> well i i'm like there's something about it being scary that like has me more engaged and it's like more exciting but i'm never like running to the bathroom in the dark because i mm -hmm. i'm now scared but there are some movies that are just so freaky that would probably get me scared or just so messed up. Which I'd love to see Louie watch one day. Yeah. <laughs> where Alex gets to choose the most intense movie. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I'd there are some movies that I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm totally down to see that. And then there's some movies where I think Alex knows that that's a line <laughs> where I'm like, yeah, I, I think I, I don't think I could go there um, for sure. But, yeah, I'm down. Let's do it. We spent about two hours trying to figure out because Alex and his mom thought I'd like Midsummer, And we, I spent two hours contemplating if I should watch it. 
And I was like, I'm not going to go through that. Not today. Yeah, that's a, a freaky one. But in like the most beautiful way. What's Midsummer about? It's like, um, well, it's about the, what's the? Mid, mid, the festival. Yeah. Summer. In uh, Sweden. Yeah, but what is the peak, the culture? The, the, like the Druid type culture or? Oh, there's a name, not Druid. Am I on the right track? Probably, I don't know. But it's some kind of, yeah, ritual thing that they do every midsummer. I can't think of the word for it, but yeah, it's in Sweden. Okay. But. It's kind of like an equinox or solstice yeah. e thing. Mm -hmm. And so all these people like from America, their, their friend from Sweden invites them and it's supposed to be this fun trip and shit gets weird. Mm. But because of it's like very um, sort of cultish, but in like a pretty way where it's all these white robes and flowers and mm. like the cinematography and stuff in it is really beautiful. Gotcha. So, um... Mia says, I'm Swedish, and it's really not like that. Midsummer, I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> Midsummer is one of our most wonderful festivals where there is no night. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the, the equivalent would be to, like, say the Independence Day doesn't have aliens, you know. Um, yeah. It's, you know, the movie title doesn't do a very good representation of, of the festival itself. I can go to Sweden now. I'm not scared anymore. <laughs> you can go to Sweden because you're not scared anymore. <laughs> what about you, Louis? What's uh, what's one of your favorite movies? Um. Well, I'm going to sound like every single person and their brother that's my age, um, but Star Wars is probably one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, just because it's the classic hero's journey, the the Odyssey journey. Um, you know, he even talks about the fact that that's, that's what he designed the movie. Out. And it's funny because I feel like I can nerd out on it, then, but then like my brother can take it to a whole nother level uh, when he comes over and I'm like, wow, I thought I knew a lot, but you know about six times more than I know about this subject. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, it's, it has always been a favorite since I was 13 believe it or not, I was 13 years old when I saw it, like really understood the movie and saw it for the first time. And I remember just being blown away to find out that Darth Vader, for any spoiler alerts out there, that Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's father, you know? And I was like, what? No! I just couldn't believe it. So since then, it's like been one of my favorite movies of all time. But, you know, I'm a big kid at heart, and everybody who is here knows that. Um, so uh, that's one of my favorite movies. Believe it or not, one of my favorite movies that I used to watch over and over again, I think, is, like, very poetic in a lot of different ways, is the, is the um, dark comic V for Vendetta is one of my favorite movies. Oh, yeah. um, I, I got on a kick where I would just, like, watch it on repeat while I'd paint. Um, because it was just, there was a lot of interesting things that they were doing in the movie. Um, so, um, that's the one with Natalie Portman, right? Uh, yeah, yep. But um, I like that movie. Um, Braveheart was always a favorite of mine. Um, trying to think if there's any sort of movies that would be sort of off the stereotypical movie that I would like the a guy my age would 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 really enjoy because there's several what's that the Beethoven movie Beethoven movie <laughs> Beethoven oh oh you mean the I thought you meant like the dog I was like I thought I was like ah. no uh immortal beloved yeah it was it was a really great movie. I love that movie. 
Um, no, that one's a favorite. I mean, you know, movies are one of those things where I had loads of favorite. I mean, I'm a huge cartoon fan. Um, so Toy Story and Pixar movies, uh, Finding Nemo is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, I, I think that movie is just incredibly clever. So that to be said um, is, yeah, it's a wide range for sure. Master Eddie writes, that's right. May the force be with you. Yeah. <laughs> I knew I'd have a fellow one out there. I've been watching Boba Fett lately, which is the new um, sort of Star Wars series that's out. So, um, and it's okay. I, I'm, I'm hoping that it continues to get better. We'll see what happens. Mia also wrote, it's this just uh, adding to the midsummer conversation. It's the summer solstice and there is no night on that day. Everyone parties all day and night. Oh yeah, because up in up there you wouldn't have um, it would it would have the sun would just be going all the way around. That's awesome. Actually when um I went to Norway it was and Alex has probably experienced this in Iceland. It was truly one of the most surreal experiences that um, it was just the day 24 seven. It yep. was, yeah, it was truly surreal and magical to have that experience. Cause you had that in Iceland, right, Alex? Yeah. Yeah, it was super weird. <laughs> uh, this is a really good question. Um, Go ahead and take a break. Because oh, I, I, I didn't set the timer. Should I get it? Yeah. So we've had a few um, questions. Well, firstly, Tina said, Tina Figarelli says, to adding to the movie that her, um, the new Spider-Man was incredible. So she just added to that movie chat. And then uh, Alicia uh, Alkasanian, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, had a really good question. Question for everyone, any contemporary female painters that have caught your attention? Go for it, Caroline. Oh, who's that female artist that studies with Odd? She's doing really interesting paintings now. Studied with Odd. How long? Oh, Molly? Molly, yeah. Molly Judd or Jude or? Yeah, mm -hmm. she reminds me of Brooklyn. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, it's funny because I I don't even look as much at names. I'm really bad with names. And I just, like, start liking work. And I know that, like, half of the people I love are, like, female, but I'm, like, trying to think about what their name is. Um, I have the same problem with guys, I promise you. <laughs> this is not just a female thing. Um, <laughs> just throw it out there, people. <laughs> don't bring, don't send me hate mail. Um, I'll have to bust out my Instagram here in a second and uh, look up some of the people that I'm like, oh yeah, they're, they're some good movie shaker. Yeah, I just found another Russian artist and her work is freaking amazing, but I do not remember her name. Oh yeah. You're talking about the one that's kind of been like making the rounds on Instagram stuff as of as of the past like couple of years. Or no is somebody new. Someone new I just found. I think they have the the word fairy in their in their no. Instagram name. That's like that's like Divya's person. <laughs> Oh yeah, I think. Oh, I have one. Lisa, Lisa Downey. Yeah, yeah. We keep trying to beg her to come paint for all of us to paint the line and get her on camera. We we love her work and Brad, you know, but he's not paying. So well, we'll keep on we'll keep on, we'll keep on the female uh, thing since that's the topic at hand. Yeah, Lee, I love. 
Lisa's Lisa has that ethereal, atmospheric quality in her work that I really love and I'm very drawn to. Yeah. And so, sort of similar to Molly Jude as well with what Caroline was saying. I really love her. Like they both have that sort of essence. Yes, it's a great question. I mean, uh, Rachel Lee. Oh, yeah. Of course. Got to see, meet her and see some of her work in person recently, which was amazing. Yeah. She was a quick rising star. We did the Mel Luca and Mary Con and Drake Gordon. We have some great stuff going coming out. The Stokes family. Appreciate that. It's okay, we can talk about stuff here. She's my one more she can't talk. All right, I'm going to keep it here with this. It's so lovely. I want to make sure I get some of these wisps. It's going to be a whole hair pile here. <laughs> 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 Just a whole pile of hair. Whole pile. Where's, where's, where's a good cat when you need one? Call up a hair pile for you. Just the way you say that's hair. Hair. <laughs> Trying to keep it fun and real here, ladies and gentlemen. Question. Hi, my question is, how do you avoid a work, a, a work overload? Ooh, like burnout. I'm um, assuming that's what you mean. Yeah, avoid a work look overwork. Oh, overwork. Um, overworked. Oh, yeah, sorry. But I do like the other, I, I like both of these questions. Um, so the overworked. Yeah. Alex, how about you take a stab at that mm -hmm. one? <laughs> well, as I mentioned earlier, I was painting an eye today, and I spent a long time on it. And yeah, not only was it moving the drawing and all this bad stuff, it was starting to look overworked. And so I wiped it out and then started to go about it in more of a i tried to my mindset shifted from just kind of painting to okay only make strokes that are furthering the painting like further to a completion or whatever and not just kind of going and sitting there and fuzzing things out and over blending or any of that stuff. It's funny, you start saying that, I'm not, I'm not, like my mark to like, get like really like <laughs> dramatic over here. Whereas like you first started out. Like, mm -hmm. Just petting the same <laughs> spot over and over. Yeah. It's good. Don't pet the same spot over and over. That will make it look overworked for sure. Yeah, do one brush stroke. Don't don't sit there and do this to the same brush stroke. Yes, sir. That's yeah. that's what's gonna make it definitely look overworked. <laughs> Talking to you, Lou. Yeah. Yep. Preaching right to me. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh yeah. JD has got the tables tonight. <laughs> That's one thing I love about you know using the fan brush here and there is that it kind of forces you to make an interesting stroke. Um, Put it down. When you put down another another thing that like I do, especially in the first stages, is that I keep it thin and actually add a little bit of the medium that I use. I can like remake a mark if I don't like the mark that I did make, and make a new one. And it's it's just going to kind of like erase the old one while I make the new one, and that actually is helpful. Louis, do you, do you know the um, painting Carrier? Um, your painting has a, a really nice atmospheric kind of Carrier vibe. Oh, I'll take it. <laughs> atmospheric actually is one of the things I was really wanting to try to put into this piece this time. Um, yeah, it feels quite dreamy, like Caroline's in a dream or something. Mm -hmm. Call it Reverie 2. Let's see if I can. Let's see. Let's see. So, uh, one in thing I was thinking about is. Um, I think Alex was watching a video on like intermittent fasting or something the other night. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, it sounds so great. Like, you know, you get focused and stuff. So, you know, I, cause I know you intermittent fast Louie. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking like to myself that, you know, in, in a minute fasting is pretty, really easy if you're not, um, I don't know, I guess painting and drawing requires so much attention that, it is, yeah, it's, I guess it's interesting to think if it makes you focused or not. Because you, yeah, you say it helps you. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know if it helps you stay focused. Um, you know, there, there's a, there was certainly a thing in, in like disciplines that when you're trying to, not what's the word i'm looking for deprive yourself of a, cer a certain level of, of pleasure uh like eating for example um you when you think about eating and knowing that that's like your trigger to remind you of the discipline that you should be that you're actually using that as a focus that's like a technique I don't actually think it makes you more focused. I think it actually reminds you to stay focused <laughs> uh, on your task at hand. Um, so I think that would be the distinctive difference for me is um, is that it's it's most certainly um, not helping. It's not like Adderall. <laughs> you know, it's not like trying to actually help you with your focus. It's it's more of you are reminded that you need to stay disciplined with the thing at hand um, every time you think about eating. Because you're not allowed to go make a sandwich. Right. And yeah. it, it's like, hey, this is what you should be thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, I've listened to like, I was listening to podcasts by this um dude who studies longevity and like how to live longer and dr david sinclair oh yeah 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 and it's all this cool stuff about fasting and i'm like what about for skinny people <laughs> like what about if you're trying to what gain does? weight <laughs> because i can't lose any more Well, you know, I think it's interesting. I think, you know, the, 
a lot of people when they talk about intermittent fasting, they'll also say that you're you're not necessarily doing it to your body is adaptable, and so it's going to slow down its metabolism to meet where you are. So it's not necessarily for just like a weight loss thing. If you do it wrong, you actually can mess up your metabolism mm. um, to a certain degree. So even for those skinny people, you know. Um, but you be eating just a whole lot of healthy fats. Yeah, when you can eat. Those avocados in me. <laughs> I've been doubling down on avos. We're an avocado kind of house here, for sure. Avocado aficionados. Avocado aficionados. <laughs> How do we kidding me? <laughs> I think that Kristen used to have a shirt that said that. Avocado be great. We've got avocado be kidding me. Yes, she had a few avocado things. Mm -hmm. Don't you hate it when you're like working in the darks and you notice something in the lights and you, you have to like redo your whole brush to get back up to the lights to fix the thing? Oh, yeah, because you got all that dark paint in your brush. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Louis, what's the what's the game plan for this year? What's the uh, what's some of the projects you'll be working on? Well, uh, I have a massive amount of portrait commissions that I have to get through. Um, you know, some of my clients have been waiting almost three years for some of my pieces. So I I have I have to stay disciplined and true to that. Self -port self portrait is in the future. Um, that's like one of the big ones, and um, it's another one. Uh, I have I have some paintings of relatives that I've been wanting to do, like my nieces and nephews and stuff for them. I certainly would love to get to. You know, it'd be a dream to be able to finally get to those pieces. And um, you know, maybe one or two other poetic pieces that are in there that I might do for just the purpose of doing them because I think for them they're beautiful and one painting. Um, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. What about you, Divya? Some passion projects on on the uh, horizon? Uh, well, just keep getting better. Just keep trying to get better. Um, I'm about to start a really big painting. Um, but after that, I'd really like to do another self portrait. Um, that would definitely, yeah, that would be awesome. Although self portraits always are very mentally taxing. So you really have to want to do a self portrait. Because every time I go through, do a self portrait, it's like this psychological, like, month of like intensity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, just because you're staring at yourself for like a month straight or more. So, yeah, I, but I would really love to do another one. Um, and, yeah, just just keep working on things that I'm not 
great at that I want to improve upon. Um, more drawing stuff and yeah. What about you, Al? Me. Um... Don't know. I'm working, I'm working on sort of a big painting right now that I would like to go well. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Just a lot of learning new things this year. Well, that sounds good. <laughs> yep. That's all I got. Usually I know exactly how many paintings I need to do and all that right now. I just like the idea of not knowing for a little bit. I don't know. Won't last long, but yeah, looking, me and Alex were looking at the snow the other day very intently. And it would be hard to mix snow like that color. Oh, yeah. It's like yeah, it's, it's, um, it's quite the challenge. I tried to attempt a, a snow plain air painting one time several years ago. Ooh, I hated it. I hated it so much. <laughs> Why, what, what was the thing about it? Like, what did it look like? It looked like snow. <laughs> yeah. um, it's just like you said, it's just a challenge. It's really hard um, yeah. to paint. And um, so I, I was like, you know, for another time, <laughs> we'll, we'll go back to this and attempt this again. <laughs> So I think we're getting close to this break, everybody, and we'll... Last session, everybody. You got this, Caroline. One more miserable, torturous pose. No, it's, it's funny because when I look at that book right now, like where my eyes have been, it looks blue, but like as time goes on, this light like impacts my eyes more and more and everything gets more like white. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I remember when I modeled, the room just started to go white. actually a really good model. It stays ex very still. Don't tell them. Like a statue. <laughs> Alex. Been holding out on this man. Whole time. Like when he modeled for Odd, I was like, wow. Like he didn't that's, move. That's, that's what got her. That's what got her. She's like, mm -hmm. man, he is the best model I should date him. <laughs> Well, didn't you say, Lily, the best models, the model who models for like the first time? Yep. Or whatever? Yeah, you know, that was. That was your first time? That was me. Have you said that before, Lily? Yep. I didn't know that. Mm hmm. Oh, it's for me. <laughs> <laughs> You're rocking awesome. Of course, I wasn't here for your first time, so. No, the first time, like, my head kept going back, and then, Divya, I remember you were using a mirror, so I saw your face in the mirror. It was pretty funny. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. So, you were very concentrated, so all I would see was... <laughs> like, it was like... <laughs> it was funny. Oh, my God. That was not good. <laughs> I'm so bad at that. Though I chose the worst angle for my head. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed the angle tonight. Louis, I remember when you modeled, I think Lisa drew you, and yeah, she drew Lisa, you really oh, good. Yeah. Lisa and Carmen. Carmen, yep. Um, we need to get out, we need to get Carmen back here. 
she she makes such a great host. Always fun and entertaining. Every now and again, there's a snicker by Divya on the corner. No, I, I was remembering that time that Carol was talking about and it was the <laughs> <laughs> when you were at um, GCA, was there any like funny? Um, quirks that anyone would do when you were drawing the model like the group you were in like did anyone do anything that like someone tapped their foot when they were thinking or just um, something random make fart noises no um i think because there are just too many people to call them out on something like that so um you know they talk about it later there, there'd be definitely people that would, that, you know, huff and puff if the model moved too much, and then that got like stifled really quickly because then the model started complaining that people were judging them, and it, it became a thing. So, um, so there's that, but <clears throat> I mean, that's not like a good story. So, oh my gosh, if you guys side at me, I would get so stressed. <laughs> yeah, that would suck. That's terrible. Yep. So, you try modeling. <laughs> right, exactly. So there was that. But no, I mean, people kind of kept their quirks to themselves when you're when you have that many people in a room. And there's also like you know, it's just like any school, it's like high school all over again. There's like pecking orders and things, and so people don't want to do things that embarrass themselves around other people. Well, you know how um, before Alex was talking about how to not overwork a painting and then it was like, don't do this, and you were like, well, now I'm hearing yeah. that and I'm trying not to do it. Did you ever find that when you were there, someone, maybe the teacher was going 1, around? thousand percent. I mean, you don't even have to finish the sentence. <laughs> you, everybody would. They'd be like, you know, how you're making these ankles, you're making them way too... Thin. You need to like widen your ankles. Next thing you're like, holy shit, my ankles are okay. Look at my ankles. You know, uh, you do that kind of thing all the time. Yeah. That was just like, yeah. That that was a, that was actually a big thing. <laughs> and you think you're the only one that does it, and you're like, man, how, they were talking about this thing, and I'd immediately start doing that thing on mine, and everyone's like, I was too. So then you realize quickly it was it was. A Everybody did. Mm -hmm. I wish I had time to go into those shadows and soften them up a little bit. I'm just going to order if I can do that on my own.
There was a question before. Someone was asking what uh, you guys think of Nikam's work. Um, I can't remember. But yeah, it was a question before. Specifically, what? I actually really like his watercolors. Um, in fact, we did one on when we were doing the, the line show. We actually did one on a watercolor he did as a ballerina. And, you know, he actually is a pretty impressive watercolor painter. Um, he's a great, he's a great painter, too. I mean, not saying that in the antithesis of what, you know, LT is or good at or isn't good at. It was just, I particularly like his watercolors. Mm. So, wish I could afford them. Actually, yes, yeah, speaking of his watercolors uh, and the snow, what well, we're talking about, the snow before, I really do love the sn his snow watercolors. Mm. They have a really nice feel to them. Yeah, I agree. In fact, I was looking at one of them just to go out and paint or take photos and because uh, I thought that it was, it was particularly Um, Alex Tabbert says, hey, Alex, when do you think you'll do another portrait workshop for East Oaks? I don't know. Um, I think soon-ish. I think soon-ish. I want to... ish No, yeah, I'd like to do another one. It'll be interesting to see the difference from the way you did your first workshop. Yeah. Workshop. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Was, was that before your first solo show? Yeah. It was like right when I got the show. Oh. So, like, yeah, right. It was like I. Oh, yeah, because I was like, I can only do this if I use the mm -hmm. painting for my show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good times. I remember when somebody slipped me a note, you better paint faster or we're going to have to, <laughs> we're going to have to do another day or something. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay, jeez. <laughs> yes, I think pretty soon I want to do another one. Up like all the things. Make this finished up a little bit. This a little bit finished up. Me too. Oh yeah, she doesn't even have an eye on the other side yet. <laughs> It's one of those where it's like, I wish, I know you don't, uh, Caroline, but wish we had, we were going to do like, you know, multiple day sessions on these. You're like, 
Ah, that gives me anxiety just thinking of that. Maybe three thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Done. I'm here. So Alicia says, thanks for today slash this evening, everyone. And Mia says, thank you all so much for today's session. It's been wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Well, that's why we do it, because I'm hoping it, it brings you value. So uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, we're, getting, we're getting close to the end here. We've got four minutes left. Uh, Paul Judd would like to know your favorite of the old masters. Any of us were just. Uh... Yeah, yeah, you know. um, well, I'm a huge Reppin fan. Love Reppin's work. It's phenomenal. Uh, I would say he's like at the top of my charts as far as portrait painters are concerned. Um, Cliche, the Rembrandt is always up there. Um, big fan of George Clausen. I, I love, uh, there's a few other ones that are kind of in that field that I really love. That, you know, Jules Breton, I'm a big fan of. And, um, Alex, what about you? Any last remarks? Well, I just finished a book about reading a book about Bouveret, Pascal Adolphe Dagnon Bouveret. And I'd say he's one of my favorite 19th century painters for sure. And Paul Jude was also wondering the best varnishes for ceiling portrait oil paintings. Uh, I use Conservar by, by um, Natural Pigments. Um, and I highly recommend that uh, to other people. Yep, that's good stuff. Sorry, I'm like not even able to paint because I'm trying to like so fast. It's hard to like blaze through here. Yeah. Got googly eyes. No, I think I might be ruining the eyes the last second. It's one of those things, it's kind of like you're like jumping off the cliff, you're like doing the dino. Like, ah, I think I got this. No! <laughs> exactly. It's better to loved and lost them. <laughs>
All song said, let it be. Louder. Louder than Way to go, Caroline. Everybody, Yay. thank y'all so much for being a part of tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. We're going to get this thing stopped. So annoying. Um, Caroline, we truly appreciate you um, yes. making an effort tonight you know, and going through the torture. Oh. Everybody, thank you for joining us this evening. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're so glad that you stayed through. I can't believe this was our 21st one. 22nd did i say 22nd or 21st he's 21st um and we'll continue to do them as long as you continue to watch so um thank you again eventually i'm sure that these at least my demo um will go up onto our our page uh, all the sales help support uh, east oak studio and the artists that are here so uh keep a uh, keep in mind that we do email blasts if y'all want to know when these things go up for sale they uh, can sign up for our email. Click subscribe if you want more alerts about when these things are happening. And um, come paint along with us. And hopefully you can get the reference images, go back, paint along with us, try some different things, post, uh, post about it at East Oak Studio, put a hashtag in there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. Have a good night.